fucking fuckity fuck fuck. It's out. My god, I never thought this day would come. Okay, okay. Let me slow down for you a little bit. You might be wondering to yourself, why am I so excited to play this game? Well, it's because I've been waiting to play it for roughly six years now. To give you an idea of just how long that is, I barely even started high school when I first caught wind of Scorn. I think most sane people would have eventually thrown in the towel and moved on to something else. But not me. Seeing that first trailer many moons ago captivated me and toyed with my curiosity with these alien abominations and this world that I just couldn't make any sense of. And sorry for the cliche, but it really wasn't like anything I've ever seen before. And I have no idea what this game was even about, but I just wanted more. So I almost constantly kept tabs on Scorn through Steam. Days turned to months, and months into years. There were some announcements I might have missed, and some I might have forgotten. God, the amount of time that's passed is unbelievable. It's interesting because not even that long ago, a delayed game didn't always really equate to a bad thing. Delays just meant that there's now a bunch more extra time to iron out some kinks, but nowadays, I'd say if a game is taking longer than 4 years to release, there better be some sort of miracle that strikes it because chances are it's going to turn out like hot garbage. If you want a prime example of this, look no further than Cyberpunk 2077, 7 year gap in between its first teaser and its release. I don't even care that there's been major improvements to the game recently. It's not even worth reminding you just how poorly received it initially was due to it being a broken unpolished mess. Hopefully, Scorn doesn't turn out to be another example of that. You wake up as, uh, this guy. Look, if RWS has taught me anything, is that if you can't think of or know the name of a character, just take the name of the game and put dude at the end of it. Postal dude, dusk dude, scorn dude, bam, that's his name. And so your objective as Scorn Dude is, well, you really don't have one. At least not one that the game boldly tells you about. This is one of those games that give you absolutely zero information about anything. Like really, you're given an opening cinematic where Scorn Dude is crawling towards a bunch of things, but to be honest, I don't even have the slightest clue of what's going on here. And I don't think there's a single moment where the game pauses itself to give you a dialogue box. Because of this, the entirety of Scorn's gameplay can be boiled down to figuring shit out for yourself and aimlessly wandering around. Fingering some of the contraptions you'll find lying around just to see what they do, and then after all of that you have to find out how they end up working together. Believe me, it's not as bad as it sounds. The level design here is pretty linear, so it's kind of hard to get lost, and even if you did, it really doesn't matter here in the specific area because everything just loops around. After some fumbling around, you should find an elevator that will take you up to the second floor of this deep dank pit and you're introduced to your very first puzzle. Did I ever mention that this is a puzzle game? Well I am now, and this is a pretty brutal one to start off with. Using this little mechanism, you can control this huge crane to move these kinder surprise eggs around. What you're supposed to do is move this egg to this lit up socket. Then using the lever right next to you, it'll bring down a claw that cracks it open and reveals that there was nothing inside. Bummer. So you might think this must be some sort of game of trial and error where I crack all the eggs open until something comes out. And... Nope, that's not what it is. The claw only cracks open eggs that have little lights on them. The only one left is conjoined with another egg, and here's the tricky part. You can only move this egg if there's two open vertical sockets. And no, you can't rotate it to make it fit through a horizontal space, it has to be vertical. So you're going to have to move all these eggs around to free up enough space for this one to fit through and get to the lit up socket. This whole puzzle is really like a litmus test to see if you're going to like this game or not. If you've been stuck on it long enough to open up a walkthrough, honestly, I gotta say that you should uninstall and try to get your money back. I was really starting to get to that point after spending like an hour and a half on it. It's not even really that hard to figure out, it's shuffling all the eggs around with the very limited amount of space you're given to do so is what makes this puzzle almost completely unbearable to sit through. But with a bit of perseverance, you'll make it through. <gasps> Friend! I'm gonna call you Jerry, and that's probably not what your name is, but I don't care because me and you are gonna go on a bunch of fun adventures together. Oh? Guys, I think I just killed Jerry. I do have his arm now though, so that's pretty cool. And you gotta use it to get to the next area. Jerry may be gone, but 
At least he didn't die in vain. So yeah, Scorn's puzzles can be a huge hit or miss for a lot of people. And personally, while I did find that egg one to be infuriating, I surprisingly enjoyed a lot of the other ones this game has. Scorn does a pretty decent job at executing its puzzles, especially considering that it really could not give any less of a fuck about holding your hand. After playing Lucius 1 and 2, I was worried that I was going to absolutely hate this game. But I don't know, there's just something about not knowing how anything works, and then playing around with it to see what it does that I got a lot of fun out of. It's pretty fitting here too since you're in this alien world, and a lot of these contraptions don't even make the slightest look of sense until you see how it works. The moments where I went from being utterly confused to suddenly realizing what I'm actually doing and I'm of seconds were huge highlights for me. Though there are times when Scorn's way of doing puzzles sort of falls flat on its face. For one, I think having a reset button for some of these should have been a necessity. Like there's this one light puzzle which again it's not terribly hard, it's just I've spent a good 5 minutes fumbling around with it at first to see what I had to do. Then when I figured out that I'm supposed to get all these dials to light up, I've messed up the order of everything so bad that not a single walkthrough was able to help me, because I somehow just couldn't reconfigure anything back to its default position. So I had to reload an older save file, which I mean, it works. The problem is that this game's load times aren't really the best. Maybe it's just my battle station, but still, I think just having a simple reset function wouldn't hurt. This does also apply to the egg puzzle. You can arrange these eggs in a way that'll completely prevent you from making any more progress, thus forcing you to load an older save file. Then there's puzzles like this one where they're so outlandish that I just cannot comprehend anything that's going on right in front of me. Because it devolves into this thing doing a thing to these things which does another thing and then something happens. Wait, did I do something wrong? Am I fucking dead? Okay, well, none of the buttons are doing anything. Uh, please don't tell me the game fucking crashed. Oh, we're back, and Scorn Dude has like an umbilical cord attached to him? Ooh, wow, now. That is just lovely. If you have to cover your eyes from looking at that, I would not recommend this game to you. And if you really want to stick around, I'd grab a bucket or something to barf in because it doesn't get any better from here. This whole next section is void of any puzzles. You just have to walk through this desolate wasteland really taking in the atmosphere around you. Again, this is really another one of those things that I didn't expect myself to enjoy, but I did. The world building in Scorn is amazing, and coupled with the haunting drones of the soundtrack make for some really surreal moments that will never fail to pull you in. And okay, I'll address the huge elephant in the room here, which is the game's unusual art direction. It's heavily inspired by the works of H.R. Giger. If you're not really that huge into art, he's the guy that's responsible for designing the xenomorphs from the Alien movies. Of course, the game does put a bit of its own twist, but even then, I still think Ebb Software did an incredible job at remaining faithful to his work. They did not even skip out on the smaller details, everything just feels like it works together so well to create an astonishing tribute to Giger. Along with that, I don't hear very many people give credit to Zizisław Bekszynski, who is among one of my favorite artists. Ebb also drew a lot of inspiration from him, and you could definitely see it when it comes to the outside areas as well as what I presume is these dilapidated buildings of the wasteland. Their silhouettes tower over you in the horizon, giving you an idea that this was once an advanced and thriving civilization but the skeletal remains of Scorn Dude's people are littered everywhere in these mauve tinted dunes, reminding you that you're completely alone on the silent planet. That feeling of desolation to me is almost ever present in a lot of Bekshinsky's work, and yet again, I feel that Ebb has perfectly captured it here and turned it into something that feels like it lives and breathes. Although you're not always alone. <laughs> Let's not forget about Jerry. <laughs> Then you've got this fuckhead here. He doesn't say or do anything, he just always creeps around you as you're walking through this building. Smug Aura mocks me. It's evil. Like, I get it, man. I probably don't have the prettiest mug around, I've got a football-sized hole in my stomach from ripping on umbilical cord, and I'm covered in all sorts of miscellaneous slimes and residues. But you gotta give me a break, I'm just trying to get to some place. Don't know what that place is yet, but, you know, I just got places to be. Uh, I don't think cables for a giant fan should squirt milk out when you unplug them, but... 
It's whatever, I guess. I should probably just stop asking questions from now on because nothing really makes sense anymore. Oh crap. Well, that's just fantastic. I've got an oversized tapeworm latched onto me, and for no real apparent reason, he just decided to start digging into my stomach cavity. Yeah, thank you for that. There's people you hate, then there's people you hate so much that you want to tear their innards out. And I guess that's what I am to this thing. I suppose it's not all bad. He does hold this little purple peyote for me. You might be asking yourself, what the fuck is that thing? What do you use it for? Around this point of the game, you're introduced to these overly complicated vending machines, one of which will fill the peyote's tendrils with yummy red juice that heals you. Which might spark another question for you guys. In a game like this, which has been mostly nothing but puzzles and walking around, why would you ever need to heal yourself? Well, for one, the thing latched onto you will dig into your guts throughout certain moments, serving as a sort of reminder that this juice isn't something you should just look over and that you should have a good amount of it at all times. And it's also for when you get yourself into a messy fight with these fleshy little bastards, which the game provides you with some weapons to deal with them. You've got a really limited arsenal with a piston gun that you get near the end of Act 1, a rather humiliating starter weapon since it's more of a tool you use for certain puzzles rather than an actual weapon. A pretty reliable pistol that you actually kind of have to go out and look for, otherwise you'll miss out on it entirely. And a triple barrel shotgun. As powerful as it is, comes with the caveat of being very slow and heavy. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Don't go into Scorn expecting it to be an FPS, because I can tell you that it doesn't feel like one, it doesn't sound like one, it doesn't look like one, it doesn't smell like one, and it certainly doesn't taste like one. This is somewhat of a topic of controversy regarding Scorn, since a lot of its trailers really showcase the guns making people think that this was going to be like Doom, when in actuality the gunplay is, uh, not the best. Honestly, it's not the worst, but it just really feels like an afterthought, and it kind of is in a way. Because little known fact, you're not really supposed to shoot everything that moves. How do I know this? From one of the trailers, of course. A hidden fauna sleeps within the underbelly of the world, wanting nothing more than to be left undisturbed. Yeah, no, if you see a critter walking around, simply keeping a safe distance from it and waiting a little bit until it enters its malicious meat hole is enough to deal with it. Mainly because they wanted players to get the idea that these are merely just animals in this world that don't want anything to do with you. It is a rather unique way of approaching combat, but could they not have communicated this in a better way to the player that isn't by one of the game's trailers? Like, off the top of my head, I think they could have held off on giving you the piston gun until maybe midway through the second act, at the very least. I know it serves a pretty large purpose for helping you through some of the puzzles at the point where it's introduced, and a lot of the early game would have had to been reworked to make up for its absence, but when you first get your hands on it, you also meet with your first quote unquote enemies, and when they damage you, chances are you're going to blast them rather than try to avoid them like the game wants you to. I think leaving you defenseless and putting you in a situation where you have to hide from a creature, then have the game visually demonstrate to you that these guys cannot give a rat's flying ass about you, would have been the best way of going about this. And if it's not this, I think having the weapons removed entirely wouldn't be a terrible idea either. Though you do use them for situations where it seems like you absolutely need to. Another problem I have with the combat is that if the devs were trying to push you towards being more of a pacifist, I think they really could have dialed the enemy encounters back a bit. I get it, sometimes they'll throw one or two more of them to sweeten a deal and raise the stakes up a bit, but when I'm just trying to get from point A to point B, having to wait for these lard asses to crawl into their holes feels like it takes an eternity. Then when I can finally walk past, the game will throw another one at me. <gasps> oh, you're fucking joking! Oh no, please, take your time! I really don't mind this game's 6 hour playtime being multiplied by a factor of 2 just because you decided to go out for a little Sunday stroll. <gasps> Fuck! Speaking of things that take way too long, this act, or... acts... Honestly, I don't know, the lack of change in scenery makes this the most boring part of the game to play through. Especially here. You gotta blow up Mushmouth's boobies so you could go inside of it and send these things which are part of this final maze puzzle. I got so disorientated here because there just aren't any distinct landmarks to help you remember where you're at, making it really confusing to try and figure out which room you've been in and which one you haven't. It doesn't help that Mushmouth is constantly staring down at you and just going... <laughs> Alright, our last stop. A city known as Polis. Get it? It's like Metropolis, but without the metro. To quote Cruelty Squad, this is like an oasis of love and friendship. 
You see, the people that once inhabited this fine city had a connection to nature with these statues showcasing a man riding a weird slug creature. They also had a thing for friendship with these other statues that showed two lovely people hugging each other. It's very wholesome. Never mind, I take it back. Fuck whatever the stupid man baby is. It's a little weird having the first boss fight happen this late into the game. Not that I really have a problem with it, just that I wasn't expecting it. Though I'll admit, it's not a very fun fight. I appreciate the devs for making this feel more like a puzzle rather than an epic explosive fight, but a common critique I hear is that people don't like running around like a headless chicken with this guy trying to kill them. And I can't blame those people, especially since that is almost exactly what you need to do to get through this fight. You literally just run around and let this dude take pot shots at you until he needs to reload, which will expose his weak spot that you need to shoot. Repeat this a couple more times till you can get to a second phase, then wait for him to expose himself or you gotta shoot him again until he's dead. You wanna know the fun part? You have to fight two more of these things. Though, to be fair, the one before this isn't bad because you can just kill him before he does anything, and the last one isn't that terrible either. Using the new grenade launcher you ripped from the other dude, you just gotta wait for this guy to reload and then just chuck a grenade into his ammo pack. I really feel like it just wasn't necessary to have this many phases to a boss fight. It becomes so tedious very quickly. And why do we have to do this? So we could throw these man babies into a blender and make a yummy red juice to feed to these guys who look like they're straight out of a Tool music video. They'll come in handy soon enough, but for now, I gotta get rid of Fuckhead. It's one thing to tear into my guts, but it's another thing to slowly turn me into a goddamn tree and give me a grenade launcher for an arm. I know on paper that last part sounds kinda badass, but this hunk of shit is about as useless as the piston gun. You almost exclusively use it to solve puzzles. Speaking of which, I can't even do most of them here because I got stupid beefy hands. About the only thing I can shove my fist into is this thing which I mean, fuck it. I've been putting my fingers and hands in a lot of things throughout this entire game. What could possibly go wrong? Ooh. Rub some dirt in its spore, I'm sure you'll be fine. For this next puzzle, you plop yourself on this bench where you perform surgery on yourself to remove that parasite. About fucking time, now we just need to get patched up and it'll be as right as rain. Jesus Christ on a bicycle! Scorn dude, think of the children, man! No, 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 you cannot tell me you've been running around this entire time with your shtekel flopping out. Somehow your people were smart enough to invent a machine where you can perform surgery on yourself and have robo-doctors, but pants? Nope, there's just something about them you can't wrap your head around. I'm waving my dick in the wind. I'm waving my dick in the wind. If it all goes right, I'll be in your arms tonight. But I'm waving my dick in the wind. So remember those tool guys I mentioned earlier? Well, they bring in an interesting new mechanic for this final yet rather rudimentary puzzle, where you can swap in between them to open up this fleshy door all the while you're carrying Scorn Dude. This man has gone through hell and back, and even right at the steps of what appears to be the pearly white gates, he just can't seem to catch a break, as he's just getting stabbed for no reason. I suppose it doesn't really matter, he's only a few steps away from chillaxing in Scorn Dude heaven. <laughs> oh crap. Yeah, nope, that's the ending. Six hours of getting your guts ripped apart, walking through puddles of flesh, being a mere seconds away from a good ending, only to be forced into a bad one where Scorn Dude is turned into a helpless barnacle humanoid thing. Scorn can be simply explained by just saying it's not everyone's cup of tea. You might think the puzzles are dumb, the combat is dumb, everything is complicated and weird just for the sake of being complicated and weird, which is all fair. But to be honest with you, I'd personally put Scorn in B tier. And I'm really not just saying that because I had to go through the horrors of high school and some of college to play this. I actually had a lot of fun with Scorn. I'll admit it has its fair share of flaws and if anything it's pretty far from being perfect. I'd even say it's more of a low B tier game if that's something I did but I don't. 
I think most of the puzzles are really engaging since I found myself actively trying to figure out what everything does in order to solve them. This game's visuals hands down are not only incredibly unique, but I think this is easily the best looking game I've played in a very long time. You could tell that there was blood, sweat, and tears to make sure every little detail fits with the art direction and then that one part of it feels out of place. And if it did, even if it's something very minor, I don't think this game's atmosphere would be as breathtaking as it is. With that being said, there's a lot of aspects to the gameplay and design that should have been given another look and be reworked. One of these things, obviously, is the combat, which could have been mostly fixed if you were just shown how enemy encounters should mostly be treated that isn't through one of the game's trailers. I am also aware of just how much cut content there is, which was revealed through the game's art book. I mean, as cool as some of these concepts are, this really isn't anything new for game development. And it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that Scorn had a good handful of these. It's kind of hard to recommend this, but I'd say if the thought of a very slow-paced game that gives you plenty of time to walk around and really take in its atmosphere doesn't exactly sound like something that'd be fun for you, then I'd look the other way. And if Morbid Curiosity is really getting the best of you, get it on Game Pass if you can. Or wait for a sale, because I'll be honest, $30 is a bit much for a game like this, which can easily leave you feeling satisfied or completely unsatisfied. <sighs>